Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. You may be seated. We are more than conquerors. That's a pretty good message just in itself, right? We're more than conquerors. We're back in the book of Romans this morning. We're in the last section of chapter 8. And I think by the time we're done today, you'll, you might agree with me that Romans 8 is the best chapter in the New Testament. When we were last here in Romans, we saw the Apostle Paul talking about the future glory that we look forward to as his children. Paul then presented that unbroken chain, illustrating the path of God's chosen to glory, from his choosing until we're glorified. In our passage this morning, we're going to focus on the everlasting love God has for us. So let's dig into our text this morning and see if we can see what God has for us here. We are more than conquerors. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who can be against us? So I, I just have to do this because it's what I do. What's the answer to this rhetorical question? If God's for us, who can be against us? Cares. Turn your microphones on and do it again. Everybody, Everybody but who cares. who cares. Everybody but who cares. Thank you, Dr. Randy. That's Smith. right. Randy says, the answer is everyone, but who cares since God is with us? That's absolutely the truth. But this question by Paul is much more than a rhetorical question. This question by Paul is the first of a series of five questions that build the structure for this final section of chapter 8. We're going to see this morning he asks five of these rhetorical questions. For the Christians in Rome, at the time they received this letter, there were a lot of forces against them. If they were Jewish Christians, Christians, the Jews were against them. The non-regenerate Jews were against them. Rome was against them. Their neighbors were against them. Everybody was against them, right? So when, when Paul would ask the question, if God's for us, who's against us? The answer is everybody. In Rome in 57 AD, when this letter was written, Christians were often hunted. They were killed, impaled on stakes, lit as torches, fed to the lions, and that's just in Rome. So the question to, to the church in Rome is a significant question. In the previous section, Paul had told them about their future glory with Jesus for eternity. He then moves back into a discussion of our life until glory. Here's what we have to look forward to, being in, in heaven in glory for eternity with, with Jesus. But until then, we've got to go through our life. Remember Paul's purpose for writing this letter to the Romans. He wanted to prepare the Roman church to be the base of operations for his Western Mediterranean swing and uh, missionary efforts. He wanted to go to the Western Mediterranean through North Africa, through South Europe, and into Europe proper. He wanted to have a base of operations that was relatively close, and Rome was the perfect city. Good travel in and out, both by road and by ship, to all the other points west, and so he wanted to make it their, his uh, base of operations. In the previous section, Paul made it abundantly clear that God's chosen will ultimately be with, glory, with God in glory. 
Those who oppose God, plan, God and His plan can't prevent God's plan. We've seen that before, right? Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. And what? The gates of hell shall not, not may not, but shall not prevail against it. Jesus told Peter, look, I'm going to build my church, Peter. You're going to be part of it. And Satan's not going to win. You can't thwart God's plan. The plan of God to build his church will not be stopped by anyone. Not Nero, the Roman emperor at the time. Not anybody that would come after him. Not Satan himself. I love the juxtaposition of the previous section in Paul's question. You're going to be in glory with, with God forever. So who could be against you? As Randy would say, no one. Everyone. Because God's in control. We'll be able to be with Jesus as brothers and sisters for eternity. Yet Satan and his forces will be working against us. I can't imagine a more difficult place to be a Christian than 57 AD Rome. Nero is really feeling his oats. He's really beginning to cause a lot of distrust of the church. He'd eventually burn down a significant portion of Rome. Scholar, historical scholars are kind of at odds whether or not he actually did it. And I think the evidence points that he did, or he at least co-opted it. So he could make the, the, the church look bad. He said the church did it. Whether he actually lit it or not, it's a different story. But he said the church did it. Now everybody in town, you can, can you imagine what it would be like if you came in and you burned down half of Lee County? And then somebody, somebody official, somebody with authority would come in and say, well, the church did it so they could build a new church. We wouldn't be very popular. Well, that's exactly what was going on in Rome. So when Paul asked the question, who could be against you? There was some serious contemplation in their minds about what he was asking. Paul goes on then, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is question number two. He builds on the previous question by asking another profound question. If God, who didn't spare his only son, but gave him up, sacrificed him for us, how will he not also give you graciously all things? Paul says that God didn't spare his own son. You know, it's easy to spend other people's money. It's much more difficult to spend your own. It's easier to send someone else's kids to war. But when you sign that declaration of war and your own children will be involved, that's more difficult. God was profound in saying to Jesus, God the Father was profound in saying to Jesus, this is your mission. Jesus was profound in saying, yes, I'll accept that mission. How could anyone think that God won't give us all that he's promised us because he's already proven he'll sacrifice everything for us, is Paul's point. God saved us for his glory and for his purpose. How can you imagine that he wouldn't do, that he wouldn't complete what he's promised to do? First of all, he can't not give us what he promised. Because he promised it. And he can't go back on a promise. Most scholars believe that as Paul was writing this, he had in mind... Abraham and Isaac. The son of promise. Not his first son. His first son was the scheming situation where Sarah used her servant to get a son for Abraham. But the first son of promise, the one that God said, I'm going to build from him a people. And God said, look, I want you to go up to the 
to the mountain where I tell you and I want you to sacrifice your son. So Abraham loads up the stuff. And along the way, Isaac says, hey, hey, dad, we got fire, we got wood. Where's the lamb? God will provide. Abraham trusted God to provide. Either in resurrecting Isaac or providing a substitute for Isaac. Most scholars believe that Paul had that story in mind when he's writing this. God didn't spare his own son, so how can he not give you what he's promised? One of my favorite New Testament scholars is Ken Boa. And in the Holman New Testament commentary, he says, The precedents God has already established by demonstrating in Paul and the believers in Rome that no one can thwart his salvific ends, and by giving the best he had to give, provide good reason for believers to rest in God's protection. God had already set a good precedent. He'd already established how far he was willing to go. Dr. Boa is saying that God always does what he says he'll do. The truth provides us comfort and assurance for the future. If you've got a 100% trustability rating, people are more likely to trust. You know, uh, years ago on eBay, before all these other places got pretty good, there, there were ratings Satisfactory ratings. How, how high could you get? And you always got upset when you would do a transaction and somebody would give you a low rating. Because it meant other people wouldn't trust you. God had already established 100% trustworthiness. So how could we even think that he wouldn't do what he's promised us he would do? Imagine if you're a Christian in Rome. Well, Nero was the emperor. Temporal, temporal things didn't look too good for you. Most of the time you had to go into the catacombs below Rome to, have, to fellowship with other Christians. Kind of like modern day China. A report has just come out in the last couple of days that the communist China, Chinese Communist Party has really cracked down on Christians. They've used the guise of, of COVID and their COVID policies but they have cracked down on the church such that most churches can't meet in the open anymore. David Platt does a, a Bible study every year called Secret Church. He does it in the open, but he started it when he was visiting a church in an area where they couldn't have open meetings, and so they would meet for... 24 or 36 hours straight in a secret meeting, secret church they called it. The church in Rome was struggling. Nero and his henchmen were all around. And they didn't want to be stuck on a post or fed to a lion. But Paul's reminding them that no one can prevail against the church. Nero is not near big enough to stand against God and his plan. So Paul continues on in verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. I love this. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? In order to understand this question, to, make, to have it make complete sense, we need to remember what Satan is doing today. Today, say, look at what John says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. That's Satan. Satan is not in hell today. Satan is up front in the throne room saying, Hey, did you see what Rich did? He's not worthy of you. Do you see how he did that? Do you see how he lied? Do you see how he stole whatever it is he's accusing you of? That's where Satan is right now. He's whispering in God's ears how bad you are. But 
So go back to what Paul says then. Keep that in mind. That's what Satan's doing right now. Paul says, who should bring any charge against God's elect? Because it's God who justifies. What does justify mean? Justify is the action of God where he declares an accused person righteous on the basis of faith in Jesus and his sacrifice. God looks at you and sees the blood of Jesus and says, You are no longer guilty. I see my son in you. So come on, Satan. Accuse me all you want because Jesus said, I'm okay. That's what Paul's saying here. So, Roman church, as Nero is accusing you, it means nothing. As you get accused today, it means nothing. Because God justifies you. You have been justified on the basis of Jesus' blood. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus' righteousness. He doesn't see your filth. He sees your righteousness. Not because you have become righteous. Because Satan is really not lying when he accuses you before God. He may embellish, but we're still sinners. Paul's third rhetorical question is much like the first. It makes no difference what Satan does, because God's the one that's in control. God's the one who justifies. Now he goes on to, a, to another question. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So go back to Revelation. Satan's going in God's ear. And Jesus is over here going, yeah, but I died for him. But I died for him. That's what's going on here. Who can condemn you? Because you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who died, and didn't stay dead. He popped out of the grave. And he's sitting at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for us. This, the grammar of this verse it makes it in the future tense. The question of who, who should condemn us should be understood as who will judge us. Well, we've already been judged and we've been found not guilty by the blood of Jesus. Our English word condemn here is the Greek word katakrinion, which is a technical forensic word that's used to describe an action of passing judgment in an official capacity. So what judge is there that can judge you past what Jesus has already done for you? Jesus is the ultimate judge, appointed by the Father. Paul has already said that God justified us on the basis of Jesus' righteousness. Jesus died to provide God that legal ability to forgive us. Now remember what we saw in Romans chapter 8, verse 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus died for you, because God has has chosen you, predestined you, ultimately will glorify you, there is now, therefore now, no condemnation. There can be no judgment against us because we are in Christ Jesus, who is also the judge. He's judging by himself his own standard, and he sees us as him. Righteous. So Paul's fourth rhetorical question is again kind of like the first. No one can judge you because Jesus is the ultimate judge and he's already died to save you. And on your case in the file room of heaven, it says case closed. It's no longer an open case. The fifth rhetorical question comes next in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? What can actually take you away from God's love? No one can stand against us and win. 
God will not spare anything since he didn't spare his own son. No one can bring a charge against us. and No one can judge us. No, no one can separate us from the love of Christ either. Look at the situation of, of the Roman Christians to whom Paul is writing. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, sword, uh, a danger, or sword. Not one of those, not all of those, are sufficient to take us out of God's love. This is eternal security. So here's a question I don't necessarily want you to open to answer out loud. What does what you are going through today fall into one of these categories? Don't think of tribulation as an end times in a, in the end times sense of the seven years. Think of it as the uh, the trouble, the, the, the difficulties you're going through. Anything that you face easily fits into one of these categories. Think about what Paul is saying here. Nothing you will go through can separate you from God's love. Nothing. There is nothing in the world that can separate you. His love is greater than anything you could ever encounter. It's eternal security. Nothing can separate you from God's love. There is no trouble you can get in that will separate you. There's not enough distress to make God not love you anymore. Persecution by the world will not separate you from God's love. You will never go hungry, so hungry that God can't still love you. Nakedness conveys the idea of being destitute. And you'll never be so poor that God won't love you. There's no danger that you could be in that would cause God to jump off and say, I'm out. Your, your uh, guardian angel may say, that's it, I'm out. I used to tell Kate when she was learning to drive, if you keep driving like that, the guardian angel is going to jump off. I suspect some of you drive like that still today. But God never will jump off. Right? Your guardian angel may, but God won't. The world can come after you to hurt you, but God will never leave you. No war or insurrection takes you out of God's love. There is nothing that ha can happen. I mean, Joe Biden could get reelected, and God will still love you. You'll, you. You might question that he still does, because he does, but you understand my point. Nothing in life separates you from God's love. You're his plan. He chose you before he created the world. There's real comfort in that. Paul go, goes on then to quote a, a portion of uh, Psalm 44.22 from the Septuagint. In verse 36, as it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long, and we are guarded as sheep to be slaughtered. At first reading, this quote seems like it's maybe a little out of place. But when you think about it for a bit, you... You come to see that Paul is quoting a priestly psalm that reflects God's chosen will face adversity and affliction. This is a psalm not written by David, but it's written by priests. And he's talking about the, the, the affliction that the world will send our way. This and many other passages fly in the face of the modern movement that God will give his children everything they want in this life. That God will, if you have enough faith, and send me $25, God will give you all the peace you can have, all the glory you can have, all the wealth that you can have. You'll never get sick. Send me $25. That's what happens. Well, maybe with inflation, they're up to 50 or 100 bucks now. <laughs> That's not what Jesus told us. He said, look, your life's going to suck. It's going to be bad. They're going to want to hurt you. But it's okay. Because you can't be taken out of my plan. No one can actually get you. Paul replies to his own question in verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors. We can't be separated from God's love because we are more than conquerors 
through the power of Jesus working in us. The word conqueror brings the idea of complete and total victory. This means that we can't fail when empowered by God. There should be comfort in that. Because frequently I feel like, I feel like I'm a failure. But we talked about this last week in the business meeting. When we're doing what God tells us to do, the way he tells us to do it, we are not failures. We're more than conquerors. All of those temporal things that pre prevail against God and his plan, because God has made us more than victorious to overcome them. This is really huge. Look how Paul continues now. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. Paul previously spoke about temporal things and the temporal world will try to separate us from God's love. Now he brings us into the spiritual dimension as well. The end result is that there is nothing. Read, no thing, nothing, physical or spiritual, that can take you away from God. Not life or death. Your death doesn't separate you from God. Quite the contrary, for the church, your death puts you in His presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Angels don't have the power to keep you from God. Demons, including Satan, don't have the power to keep you from God. Despite what Charlie Daniels wrote in The Devil Went Down to Georgia, he's not going to barter for your soul. And if you don't play well enough, he's going to take your soul. That doesn't work. As a Christian, I think Charlie Daniels knew that, but it's still a good song. The world ruler of the Greco-Roman period couldn't take you away from God. All the gods of the Greco-Roman mythological system couldn't take you from God. Things going on in the present and things going on in the future can't separate you from God. Powers is a reference to satanic forces. Satan can't steal your soul as we've already seen, height and depth are references to the spiritual world. Height would be heaven. Depth would be hell. You could view this as forces of good and evil. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.